I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. The first sighting of wild garlic in the hedgerows heralds the arrival of spring, and for that reason alone, I love it. But of course, it is also delicious. The delicate white flowers are charming, and for me at least, there is a buzz to be had from foraging for food. The other key ingredient in this omelet is mussels, and happily, these are available pretty much everywhere. Simple and quick to cook, this is a sophisticated take on the perennially popular omelet. So, two very separate stages to this quite quick recipe, but cooking the mussels first is, is the first thing to do. However, before we do anything, we need to determine that our mussels are still alive. As you can see, some of them are still slightly ajar. So what I like to do is to just pick it up and tap it. See, the way it's closing. So they're, they're all good. So putting them into a saucepan that they fit really quite snugly into, then a little white wine, and then just a little bit of thyme. And I'm going to put these on a relatively low heat. The other thing to say is, is that they cook unevenly. So what I like to do, see a lowish heat there, like that. I like to put use a Pyrex plate as a lid so I can see into the saucepan. While they're cooking, and I'm keeping a half an eye on them, let's look at the wild garlic. This is the first one you see every year. Every part of the plant is edible, the leaves, the flowers, and if you were to go out and dig it up with a trowel, the little bulbs and roots underneath, after a good clean, they're all edible as well. Then the second garlic that appears a little bit later is this one. This, as you can see, is completely different in shape. It's got a much wider leaf like that. This can be eaten raw, cooked, soups, pestos, add into stews. It is genius, absolutely brilliant. So I'm going to use the wide-leafed garlic, and I'm going to chop this and have it ready to add to our mussels when they are cooked. Chop my wild garlic, including those lovely um, stalks. This is just, I can't tell you how excited I get when I see wild garlic coming. Okay, that's ready. Let's look back at our mussels. Okay, great. So things are starting to happen here. So, see the way it's obviously popped open? Perfect. Plump, shiny, gorgeous. So as they open, take them out. And they won't all open at the same time. So I'm going to put the... Um, lid back on there for another moment or two, but literally only a moment or two. So the other thing I can be getting ready are my eggs. So um, the nicest eggs you can get your hands on. I'm doing four, and four eggs is as, is as many as I would make in a single omelet. And this is enough for two people, I reckon, as a starter, or it's, well, it's definitely enough for one person as a main course, and it would need to be one hungry person. Pinch of salt, always. A little twist of pepper. Some people like to put a little bit of milk or cream into their omelette. I'm going to put a tiny little splash of cream like that. Back to my mussels. You need to be, you need to be on your metal when you are cooking the mussels. You don't overcook them. So that's coming out. Okay, that's all of my mussels. Now, what I like to do is to strain the juice. I'm just going to pour it over like that. And then this goes back into a saucepan. At this point, I can lift out my little thyme stalk because that's done its job. So that's going back on the heat. I'm going to reduce it by half. Now, I'll keep myself busy here, beating my eggs. But once it falls off your whisk like that, that's ready to go. So my liquid is just bubbling up here. I'm going to put the heat on under my omelette pan, so that's ready to go. Now, I'm confident that I've boiled off half of the uh, wine mixture, so I'm adding in a little bit of cream, just for a little bit of richness. And then I'm going to also add in my chopped wild garlic. While that's happening, I'm going to take my mussels out of the uh, shell. Now, the other thing you need to watch out for at this stage, sometimes there's what's called a little beard growing in here. And that's that little tuft of hair. That little beard won't do you any harm whatsoever. 
by the way, if you eat it. It just doesn't, the texture isn't very good. These then, we add back into our little sauce, like that. And then I like to bring these back up to a bubble, and then I turn off the heat. Don't overcook it, because you could toughen the mussels even at this stage. So that looks really delicious at this stage. I don't want a particularly thick sauce here. So I'm going to take that off the heater, actually. I can really, at this point, pretty much turn the heat off underneath it. Okay, so a little bit of butter, a little bit of oil. Swirl it around. Go up a little bit around the sides. This all happens very, very fast. In with your mixture. An omelette should be in and out of the pan in no length of time. Okay, sign of the cross coming up. Tilt the pan away from you. Allow the runny egg to run out. Second part of the cross, the runny egg running towards you, go to the right, go to the left, and then just keep swirling like that. I'll let it sit for a moment like that, then I'm going to get my plate, so that's ready to go. I want the omelette just cooked, I don't want any liquid egg in there. And you see the way I'm going up along the side of the pan? That's why I said about swirling your oil and butter up so it doesn't stick up there. Now, it's not quite cooked yet. As you can see, it's still a little bit runny. But I can start to spoon some of my mussels in here. So where my mussels are now is basically where the centre fold of the omelette is going to be. I'm keeping some of the mussels in the pan just for a sprinkling over at the last minute. So that's pretty much ready. Okay, so then to take it out of the pan, just sort of flick it away from you like that once, and then bring it close to your plate like that, and give it a second flick, and then the third flick should be just like that. And then I'm going to put the rest of my mussels, just a couple of them on top, like that. Then I like to take a few of the wild garlic leaves, just put them raw on, like that, and then, if you can manage to get a few of the little flowers, totally optional, completely edible, lovely to look at, and really delicious. And then you need to have your knife and fork on the table, ready to go, um, a little bit of bread and butter, lovely. The meatballs in this next dish are made with chicken and pork, but they are flavoured with a mixture called charmoula, a highly flavoured and spice-laden mixture from North Africa. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is so easy to make, keeps in the fridge for a couple of weeks, but more importantly it adds flavour and depth to so many dishes. So these meatballs are definitely a bit of a commitment in terms of the amount of work that's involved, but get yourself organized and get all of the various bits ready that we're going to assemble. But once it goes into the oven, then your meal is really ready to be served an hour later when it's cooked. So the defining flavor here is this lovely North African mixture called charmoula. And in here, I've got some chopped chili, uh, coriander, coarsely chopped garlic, a little cumin seed, paprika, olive oil, and some expensive but delicious saffron. And I quite simply blitz it all together. So just blitz it like that, and you get this gorgeous, uh, deep, sort of earth-colored paste. So the meat in the meatballs that I'm using, I've got some minced pork with a nice bit of fat and my minced chicken. So I'm going to mix both of those in there. The other thing I have, I've got some onions and a little bit of garlic, actually, which I sweated off, and now I've allowed them to cool completely. But these are completely cooked through at this stage. So they're going in there. Then, the rest of the ingredients, some breadcrumbs. There's almost always uh, some breadcrumbs in meatballs. A little Parmesan cheese, like that. Then, herbs. Parsley, obvious enough, I suppose. And then, I'm adding a little chopped marjoram. So lots of really, really delicious things going in here. An egg to bind the mixture together. You could beat it first, but honestly, I just crack it in there like that. And then the charmoula mix. So that's going in also. Now, very importantly, some salt and pepper to season up all of the ingredients really nicely. Now this makes a lot. This will make about 20 to 24 meatballs. 
um, but there's serving, I think, for eight, if not ten people in here. So make sure you have everything in which I have, and then mix us all around together. Okay, good. I've also roasted some red onions. Depending on the size of the ear onion, cut them into quarters, sixths, or perhaps even eighths. I'm cutting down and keeping the root intact on them like that, and cooked until they're pretty tender. So that's those guys ready. The other thing I need, um, and I've ready, are some peeled cherry tomatoes. At this stage, what you need to do now is to roll the mixture into balls. And this is messy, and there's only one way to do this, is to get stuck in with your hands. Okay? And while I'm rolling the meat into balls, I've got my pans heating here for frying them off. So we'll see all of that in a moment. So these I roll into about 50 gram balls. Okay? Like that. You may not get perfect orbs or spheres, but that's pretty good. And I like to do all of this part of the recipe before I pan fry them. I'm going to pan fry them before it gets assembled. This is the true taste of Kerrygold. It's hard work and dedication. It's the relationship of farmer and cow. It's early mornings, late nights. It's family. It's loyalty. It's rich green grass. It's life out on the pasture. It takes strong hands and a warm heart to make Kerrygold. Okay, good. Now we're ready to just to brown off the meatballs a little um, before we do the final assembly. So I've got some frying pans on here heating, um, a little olive oil. And then don't overfill the pan, but do make sure your oil is hot enough. Then, just pop them in. You hear them immediately starting to sizzle. Put some in here as well, actually. Completely confusing. Little space between them. Lovely. So let them sit there for a moment or two, just to sort of firm up and get color. And then have a little sneaky little look and see how you're doing color-wise. So. Oh yeah, lovely, getting a lovely bit of colour there. Now, this little caramelisation that I'm getting on here now, again, is one of the elements of the dish that brings together all of the um, flavours and just gives it a little extra lift. The other thing I have, I have a little bit of chicken stock heating here as well, because when I put these into the gratin dish to assemble and we're nearly there, um, I'm going to moisten it with chicken stock, so that becomes a delicious sort of concentrated sauce. So bring in all of your elements so you don't get this into the oven and suddenly realize you've forgotten something. I can now go ahead and transfer my onions into my dish. All of them. Lovely. So lots of robust flavors going on there. Now, at this point, my meatballs, as you can see, have got lots of uh, lovely color on there. So I'm just going to pop those in. And you just lift them up. Now, this is going to be a tight fit. Okay, lovely. The onions, the meatballs now, the tomatoes. So don't forget to season the tomatoes just a little before you put them on top. So a pinch of salt and a pinch of pepper. And just mix that around. And the tomato, like that. And then finally, just a little stock, about a pint, 450 mils of stock, which I brought to a boil, or to a simmer, really. Then, I'm going to cover these while they're, the, while they're in the oven cooking. So this is my dampened sheet of greaseproof or parchment paper. Lovely. Okay, that paper protects them slightly in the oven. I want a little bit of colour, but not too much colour. So they're going to go into a preheated oven, which I've preheated 200 degrees, and they're going to cook for one hour. Mm -hmm. 
Just before I take the meatballs out of the oven, I'm going to grill a little bit of bread. What I like to use and is, is this funny little thing called a brustolina. And I find this makes the most fantastic grilled bread. So it just goes dry on and it starts to smoke quite quickly. So I'm using sourdough bread or nice quality white cheese bread would be good. But the slight sourness in the sourdough is delicious with the meatballs. So I've got a nice big dish that I'm going to sit my meatballs down on top of. At the same time, keeping an eye on my grilled bread. Lovely, that's good. Now, our meatballs. And take the paper off like that, just so I can see where the level of the liquid is, so I don't burn myself. These look absolutely gorgeous. Lots of lovely juice. More juice in the pan now than when it went into the oven. Lovely. Some chopped parsley. Some chopped green olives. You can imagine with the briny olives and the sweet meatballs will be really delicious. Then some of the grilled bread. Then at this stage, because we're sort of going for it in terms of the presentation, some sprigs of rosemary, bay leaves, if you have them. Okay, and there's one final thing that I would be inclined to do. Actually, there's two final things I'd be inclined to do. One is put a tiny little drizzle of olive oil on the grilled bread. And perhaps the last finishing touch, which may seem surprising, is a little bit of grated lemon zest. So, you know, this, you take meatballs, you think no complexity, this is complex. When you taste the lemon, the olive oil, with the rich meatballs and the meat juices, you know, it's just, it takes a mere simple meatball, I think, despite all of the hard work, um, onto a different level. The dessert I'm making today is a light caramel meringue served with green gooseberries. Nowadays you hardly see them, so this is my attempt to make them popular again, which they richly deserve to be. Sweetened in their preparation by some elderflower cordial, the undeniable tartness of the fruit is balanced by the sugar in the caramel meringue. Meringues rather like cakes seem to inspire admiration in their creators, which is lovely, but a bit misplaced. Meringues honestly are really incredibly easy to make. Of course, nobody needs to know that when you place the dessert in front of your delighted guests. So, I'm going to start off with the meringue. I've got some egg whites, 100 grams of egg whites, which go into a spotlessly clean bowl. Then I've got uh, twice that volume, a quantity of, in this case, demerara sugar. So that just all goes in together. There's no folding or extra mixing in here and we turn on the speed and beat it for about 10 minutes. So, off we go. Okay, this is looking pretty good. I think we are there. So, what you're looking for is for the mixture to be really stiff. So it holds a fairly stiff peak like that. That's perfect. And if you turn to the bowl upside down, there's no fear of the mixture coming out. That's the key. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put um, a slightly raised edge around the meringue to hold the gooseberries and the sauce in place. So um, what I do usually is take some of the meringue and put it into the piping bag. And I fitted this with a star-shaped nozzle and that will give a nice, just a nice sort of pattern. I put even slightly more than I think I'm going to need in there, which is about half of the mixture. And just put that to one side. And then the rest, I'm just going to spread onto my parchment. So it's definitely parchment, not greaseproof. If you use greaseproof here, the mixture will stick and drive you completely crazy. Okay, so spread it out. I find a spoon like this works well. And that's pretty good to start off with. So then, squeeze the contents of the bag down like that. And then I like to do a little sort of shell-shaped pipe on here. So joining it on to the disc like that. So squeeze. And you get a little tail like that, a sort of an unfinished tail. And you go back over it. Now, it could just be absolutely be a flat disc. And you know what? That would be lovely. But clearly, this gives a finish. Then one little rosette like that, 
and then any little bits I have left in the bag, they go on there, and then I'll smear those out as well nicely. Okay, and then straight away pop that into your preheated oven. Great. So that goes in. It takes about an hour to cook. I like the meringue to be dry. And we know it's cooked when the meringue lifts off the paper really easily. And the next element that I'm going to concentrate on is the butterscotch sauce. So I've got some dark, lovely, soft brown sugar like that. And some castor sugar. Some butter. Normal salted butter. It could be unsalted butter for that matter. And then some golden syrup. And we put all of this on a low heat until the sugars dissolve and melt out. Now, the other thing I can get cooking are my gooseberries. So I am using um, some frozen gooseberries today. Just perfect. So those go in there. Very, very little water, just two tablespoons of water, like that, because the gooseberries will throw out lots of their own juice, and a small amount of sugar. And I'm going to put a low heat under that. Now, while that's cooking, I'm going to grind up my praline. So I've made some hazelnut praline here. So I put some uh, roasted and peeled hazelnuts into a saucepan with equal quantities of sugar, cook them on a nice low heat, stirring them every now and then so it cooks evenly, and cook it until the sugar cooks out to this deep caramel colour. So I'm going to grind this large piece here into a nice coarse-ish powder. These bits I'm going to keep for sprinkling over the finished meringue. Lovely, that's good. Now, look what's happening in here with our butterscotch sauce. So now I'm going to just pull that off the heat for a moment. Just put it there and just add the cream in slowly. Lovely. And that's going to go back on the heat, come back up to a simmer. That is your butterscotch sauce. Now, I have all of my bits and pieces pretty much now ready to assemble the meringue. The gooseberries, which are cooking away in here, they need plenty of time. They need to be completely tender. That's really important. And when they're cooked, because I have some cooked and cooled here, that's what they look like. You see the way they're completely, just completely soft. So they're just going to break really easily when you put them into your mouth. So I think we've pretty much all of the elements we need now to put our meringue together. So again, I think this deserves a nice big plate like this. It's also fun for you if you've gone to all of the trouble of making everything. So I've got a little whipped cream and the one remaining ingredient I have here is some elderflower cordial. So I'm adding a little of the elderflower cordial into my whipped cream and it just softens it ever so slightly. So spreading that on my meringue disc is completely cool. One I'd made earlier, the other one is still cooking in the oven because that needs to be completely cooked. And then we're going to put on some of our gooseberries. I don't really want the liquid here, like that. Now, a little of our butterscotch sauce, not too much. And when the butterscotch sauce cools, you can see the way it thickens slightly. So, drizzle like that. Then, some of our hazelnut praline. I'm going to go right around like that. Everybody loves praline, in my experience. And then, if you have kept a couple of sort of shards of the praline separate, and you want to make a somewhat more dramatic presentation, so I think this is a really lovely way of serving these hard, green, bitter gooseberries. They're well worth growing, or if you don't grow them, buying them. And combined with the caramel, the praline, the meringue, the cream, elderflower, lovely.